Um, thank you for inviting me. My name is Henry Hirschman. And if any of you have any questions before or the middle of it or the end of it, you can raise your hands and tell me your name and give me your questions loud and clear. Like you, you have, you remember singing that song? Shout uh, uh, out your names loud and clear so I hear what you say. So I wouldn't have to ask you twice, what did you say? Don't whisper. Speak loud. And I, I got some amendments here for you that you can look at. Well, I'll, I'll point it out. You can look at, but this is, how, how old are you? Uh, 17. And you? 16. And you? 16. 16. Do we have any 14 or 15 or 30? Okay. Now this year, and I want to tell you, I was born in Germany. And I went to high school. But when I was 13 or 14, I think the date will be out. I was an excellent swimmer. And this is one of my life-saving certificates. <clears throat> that I got for uh, for late, for making believe I was saving somebody's life. Um, you had to be a certain age to do that. And I'll tell you what I had to do. Um, I, I lived on the, lived on a, my parents lived on a river, on a pretty big river. And they took us a weight and painted it right and let that sink to the bottom of the river where I lived. And I had to dive and found that and bring it back up. Then I had to, uh, I forgot the, the arm movement. I had to pick somebody who supposedly didn't know how to swim and grab him on the my on the his neck and bring him up to save him. So that was this, and this also had to be, let me see if I can nail down my cave. That was from the school. Okay. On this one, I was 12 years old when I succeeded in making my... Uh, this is something that I brought home a couple of years ago. A couple of years ago, with a friend of mine in Germany, I went to the concentration camp that I was sent to when I was 18 years old. And I was there from, uh, from November 1938 until April of 1939. I did not realize at the time, but I found out a couple of years ago, if my parents, my poor parents, had not sent money to the camp, I probably would have never gotten out. I mean, got to get out to, to get home again. When I got home, I wasn't there very, very long because I had a pending visa to come to emigrate to the United States. Unfortunately, I was the only one in my family. 
my parents, my two brothers who were younger than I am, were killed in Minsk in Russia. How they got there is beyond me because we all grew up and we were born in the area near Frankfurt, Germany. Have any of you ever been overseas? So where, where were you? Um, I went to England. England? Where in England did you go? Um, London. Just London? And you? I went to France. Where in France did you go? I was in Paris. Okay, that was too rich for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Where did you go? I went to Italy. Where in Italy? Uh, we went to Rome and Venice. Venice, I've been there. And that is a gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. What did you see? Michelangelo? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, and there's a lot of pretty so paintings and houses. Who else for us? Okay. Um, I went to Costa Rica. And Costa Rica? That's where I never have been. So that's interesting. How long were you there? Sir? How long were you there? A week. And can you tell us a little about it? Um, there were a lot of monkeys. <laughs> and, yeah. Well, they have a lot of monkeys there. Um, you know, we got to drink a lot of exotic drinks and eat a lot of exotic foods. Um, yeah, and I had a really good tour group. Um, and, oh. I'm listening. Yeah, that's about it. Okay, this is and, uh, one of the best parts of this book. I don't know what happened to it. It got this place. This was my, when I was in the army, yeah. after I went overseas fighting war. Well, this tells all about where and how we, we went. And the best part, and I'm still searching for it at home, there was a big map in color that showed to Europe how we went from England. We landed at the, at Utah Beach in France and went all through France, through Germany, uh, through Munich, and Salzburg, Austria is where we ended up. Our war days are over. So when I was, when we were in Munich, I think the war, World War II is what I'm talking about, always came, was at a close. But we didn't know it, I guess the, the, the staff upstairs, they knew that the war was going to be over pretty soon because we were getting pretty close to its Salzburg. While we were in uh, Munich, and I didn't know <coughs> at the time how to drive a car, I asked my battalion or battery commander, <coughs> I was in the field artillery, and I asked him if he could send a car with me to go to God, uh, to go to it's when you get to be my age sometimes <laughs> sometimes it's ready to leave you. I'm trying to think of the name of the place. One of the Fiat concentration camps outside of New York. Is it Bergen-Belsen? Huh? 
Bergen Belson? Which? Was it Bergen Belson? No. Auschwitz? Huh? Was it Auschwitz? No. Dachau? Huh? Dachau? Dachau? Dachau. We went, thank you. <laughs> we went to Dachau. And that was shortly or briefly after American units, not mine, but some other American units had liberated Dachau. To this day, to this day, if anybody ever told me there was no Holocaust, there was no such thing, I would spit inside. Because what I saw, if I think about it today, it makes me sick to my stomach. The payroll cars with all the, I hate to say this to young people, uh, with corpses loaded up so high. And I took some pictures. Um, after that, I had a German girlfriend. And I think that girl must have been very much ashamed of what happened there. And those pictures of mine that I took disappeared. I never saw them again. But I was back in I was back in Germany a couple of years ago with some good friends of mine. Um, I went to see Buchenwald, the concentration camp I was in, and uh, I, this friend of mine, well, some people ask me, why do you go back to that God-forsaken country that threw you out or gave you such a bad time? Um, all I can tell you in Germany today, the part that I came out of, I have five good, very close friends, and I don't want any more out of fear that somebody I may be talking to or get friendly with may have killed my parents and two brothers and countless cousins. Um, one of the five people is one of my very best friends. Now I hope I'm not going to make any enemies here. What, what religions are we? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to me. But one of my very, very closest friends and best friends is a Protestant minister. And he and I have been very close. He and his family have been in Charlotte many times. As a matter of fact, the first time he came with his whole family, his wife and three children. And after they left, I opened up my refrigerator, and his children were, were little. What do you think I found in the refrigerator? Absolutely nothing. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> nothing. But um, he, he's come to this country often because he wanted to reconnoiter. He was interested. Every time he came, every year he came, he would see a different part of the United States. I think he was very, very interested in the Southwest. Um, so, um, let me ask you, if any of you have any questions of me, okay, stand up, give me your name. Um, I'm Franklin, um, and... You're Frank? 
Franklin. Nice to meet you. Good to meet you. Um, and I was wondering, guess what happened to those pictures that you took? Guess what happened to those pictures? God only knows I don't. Because I took some pictures, and I think the pictures I took were of skeletons and very old cars. And skeletons, I mean, pretty near people who walked like skeletons, who were, were ready to fall over because they were so emaciated. But I do not have those pictures anymore. Thank you. And I want you to stand up and give me your name. Um, I'm Seaton. Seaton? Mm -hmm. Good to meet you. I was just wondering, what was it like in the concentra concentration camps? That's a good question. Um, okay. On the 9th of November, 1938, um, there was, there was a third um, participant of the German staff, they were in Paris, and some Jewish guy was so angered what was going on that he killed him. But I think that was uh, that was more or less a make-up proposition by the Nazi government because they used it. You can sit down if you like, uh, because they. <coughs> They, they didn't need an excuse. They had planned to incarcerate Jewish men from the ages of, I would say, 18 until ripe old ages to incarcerate them into a concentration camp. Uh, in those days, they were not as fierce and as killing willingly as they were in later years. But it was bad enough because we were in a train ride. My, my mother had called me and she couldn't say very much out of fear that whatever she had to say may be held against her. She was telling me, uh, I was an apprentice in a town outside of Frankfurt called Offenbach. Uh, I don't know, you, none of you probably have ever been there, but it's very close to Frankfurt, which is a main point. And uh, my mother said, Henry, why don't you, she didn't call me Henry. My name was Heinz. But, but when I came to this country, I figured it was too hard for the average American to pronounce the name Heinz. So I changed myself to Henry. She said, why don't you go visit our relatives in Holland? But I was a youngster and I didn't have enough money. I had enough money to just go home that evening. Uh, and I went home. My parents conducted a hardware store. There was housewares in there and porcelain, all kinds of nice porcelain giftwares made in Germany. And uh, um, and I tell you, after I got there, there was a horrible noise because.
because I went upstairs to our sleeping, our <coughs> store was on the ground level. <coughs> our living quarters were on the second floor. There was a tremendous noise uh, from the SA or SS of the neighborhood. They destroyed every single thing they could get a hold of. They came upstairs to our bedroom and slid open pillows and threw the feathers on the street. I mean, it was, it was a horrible thing that I wouldn't want any of you to ever experience. Um, so this was, this was going on for a while. Yes? Um, I'm James. Um, and how were you captured? Um, how were you captured and taken to the concentration camp? What were you doing? It wasn't a matter of capture. If the local police knew you, and when they came, when I started talking about, they came to the house from the local police and said to my mother they had to take me to a police station but I would be back home shortly. Little did I know and where we lived is much like Charlotte was in January and February in Port of March. Very, very cold and nasty and I had just got a brand new winter overcoat. I, I was glad I had that on because in the concentration camp that was enough for me to make my to be my blanket at night and to warm me up because it was so cold and there was, let's say, a barracks maybe was the length of a couple of wood oil fields. And there was one tiny little stove in the middle that didn't do anything but burn wood. So if you had a sleep right there, uh, you have seen the insides of the concentration camp, right? There are about three or four layers, and I guess the younger ones who were able to, like myself, I was younger, had to climb up and sleep up there. In the morning, we had to get up early. I actually doubled up a little too much. When we first got into the concentration camp, we had to stand up the whole day. And those who was who did not cut the whip from the SR and SS troops. Mm -hmm. They got whipped. So the next day we were told we were so good standing up, we now were able to sit down. And why do you think we could sit down for? Do you have an idea? I don't so. The ground was concrete, right? But they had tarred it overnight, tarred it, and put pebbles on it, like you get for road repair, right? That's what we had to sit down on. My, my new winter coat <laughs> that I used for a blanket. So, um, um, if you wanted to use what we call the latrine, you had to be very, very, very careful because it was stuck or maybe some of us had a dig at first, a long hole, and it was deep. 
and the loan was very much like in Charlotte here. Can you imagine when loan gets wet, it gets slippery, and those poor guys who slipped off there and fell in there, you might as well say goodbye to them because some of them were too old, they could not climb up out of there. So those were some of the shortcomings, I mean some of the uh, things that we had to live through. Uh, and I have never forgotten, we were told that we would get a number because they would address us by the number, not by our name. Would we forget the number, we might as well be dead. Because that's what we went by. So I thought for a long, long time that I, that for me it was a fantasy, that number that I was supposed to remember. But it wasn't, because I remember to this day, and I've forgotten that I was supposed to be here tonight. <laughs> but my number was 25340, and I still remember that to this day. Um, yes? Well, didn't they tattoo the uh, number to your wrist? Well, that's a good question. It wasn't the wrist, but it was in the arm. This came a lot later than in 1939, 1940. Uh, the, the, the Nazis did that to people they had in the concentration camps that they put a number in their arm. But I did not have that. I had no number to show for, thank God. Um, the, there were other concentration camps that you read about, that you see in movies. I was fortunate enough, by that time I was in this country, but I was Horrible. And to this day, I cannot understand or imagine how cruel people can do something to their bodies, to their friends, to the people who live with them. It's, it, it's hard for me to understand. Um, I have some, I have some mementos that, that, that whenever you, you're welcome to go through it and I can explain it more. Uh, this is, this is my army, uh, my whole army career. We went from, oh yes. Uh, I was told, I actually went, when I came to this country, I wanted to do something that I did not, got, did not get to do when I was leaving Germany. Namely, I wanted to study to be a chemist, mechanical chemist. Well, I never did, and I, when I got to my draft board in the Bronx in New York, uh, that lady said to me, if I were you, I wouldn't worry about going to college or university, because pretty soon you're going to be in the Army. Well, I think she was right. and. I remember when I was inducted, which was in New York City, and they took us to camp 
Upton, or any of you from New York, Camp Upton was near New York City in Long Island. And they put us on a troop train. And let me tell you, it was not a fancy train like some of you have seen in the movies. It was, it was, we were sitting on plain coaches. Now, you, you, you sat down here and your legs were there. And this guy was sitting here and his legs were next to my body. That's how we slept. And the train went from, I always wanted to see the United States. On that trip I did, partially. Um, we went from, the, from New York. We went due west, and then north, and then south, and then east, and then west again. And that was, to confuse the enemy. Who do you think our enemy was then? Russia. Huh? Oh. Any guess? Yes. Japan. Right. You're right. You're 100% correct. We had to confuse the enemies as to our whereabouts. So we went this way, that way, up north. And when we got to, when we finally landed in Camp Adair in the state of Oregon, so you can imagine how far we went in about 10 days going up and down. Uh, Camp Adair, and it was around Thanksgiving. Unfortunately, a lot of GIs got sick and got pneumonia. And that wasn't all that good. So they stopped some of our basic training. But to give you an idea, and I was good in, I had a very good sense of directions. You know, when you stood at a certain place in the class, and I'm talking about camp there, near outside of Corvallis, Oregon, on a beautiful day, you could see the snow-covered mountains on Mount Hood. So that's how far north we were. So we had our basic training, and I think I consider myself today very, very fortunate. The true train that I was talking about a little while ago, from New York to Oregon, was 600. I would say out of the 600 men, um, a few were in the field artillery, and I was one of them. What entitled me, I don't know to this day, but um, I was in the field artillery, there was ordnance, there was a couple of other things, but most of them wound up in the infantry. And the infantry division that was formed was the 104th Infantry Division. And our anthem was the timber wolf. The white timber wolf in the green field. I think I may still have one at all. Uh, and in our base, I, I, let me tell you something, I have never, never been back to Oregon because my wife, at, at times when I wanted to, was sick and I couldn't leave home. But one of these days I want to get back to Oregon. It's one of the most, I mean, there is nothing wrong with Charlotte and North Carolina and South Carolina and Virginia. But the, uh, I, want, I would like to get back the, um, Oregon is a beautiful, beautiful state. Uh, as a matter of fact, 
I don't remember to this day, but I got a date. They could not have sent us overseas. Can you figure out why? And I was not, I was not a citizen. They could not have sent us. Go ahead. Because you didn't have a passport. No, because I was not a citizen. They could not send me overseas. So what do you think happened? There were, there were about 80 of us who were not citizens. They come, came from all over the globe. So they assembled us and had us wear allegiance. by a two-star general, and I will never forget that, and I will never forget how I became a citizen. I was so proud about it. Um, I think that general, or another one, who was in charge of Camp Adair, oh, incidentally, Camp Adair was needed by a U.S. Senator, and Camp Adair was large enough to, to uh, train two solid infantry divisions at the same time. So you can imagine how much space that, that took. Um, but if any of you ever have a chance, to travel, make Oregon your destination. It's such, it was such a beautiful state. I hope it didn't go up. Yes. Um, we went to uh, last year for our super trip for Boy Scouts. We went to Seattle, which is right near Oregon. It was really pretty. It was what? It was really beautiful. Oh. Well, it was Seattle. Seattle wasn't very far, uh, and the state of Washington was right above us where we were, and it, it just was beautiful. One of the things, as I became a citizen, I will never forget it. I had some wanderlust, and I wanted to see part of what Oregon had, and I wound up at a place called Crater Lake. Now Crater is spelled not with a G, but with a C. C-R-A-T-E-R. -E what do you think a crater is? I have never seen such beauty in all my life. You can stand on top of Crater Lake and look all around that lake. It, 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 it mirrors back in all kinds of colors. So I wanted to, I mean, I, I liked the lake so much <coughs> that somebody gave me a bump after a while and said, you know what? If we don't get off this place, and this is what time, you have to remember, there'd be nobody left to take you back to your base. So there went a lot of cars going, and I think maybe one of the last few cars we went to uh, an area that I also will never forget. It was Bent Burns Klamath Falls. Bent was in Oregon, I believe. Burns may have been in Idaho, or maybe I got it reversed. And Klamath Falls was near the California border. But such beautiful country, I could never get enough of it. So, uh, I have a question, sir. Yes. So, so after the Army, what did you do after after Army career? Did you live in Charlotte or? What, uh, let me see. Well, I actually, as I said, I didn't have my parents.
parents with me, but I lived with my aunt, who was, I was the first born, and I was one of the first ones picked out, and I was always a favorite of my aunt. So I didn't know, by that time, they had gotten to New York, and uh, in the beginning, I'm talking about 19, early 40s maybe, things were tough in this country. And nobody, I mean, nobody made a living very much. What was your question? What did you do for your career in your, as a job? Well, I didn't, I didn't know very much. It was a question, what was I going to do to uh, survive? Because I had a family by that time. I had two adopted children. So I had to feed them too. So the only thing that was left for me is maybe travel. And everybody in New York said, you're, you're a fool. Most of us who are traveling want to come inside and take an inside job. You want to go outside. And well, I'll tell you something that was very, very... So I decided I wanted to move south to move my family. So let me tell you what happened. Uh, my, the people that I worked for in New York uh, did a little business, a little but tiny little business with us. So I felt, well, maybe if I go down south, Maybe I made a good living. You know what people in New York told me? You're making a bad, 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 bad mistake. First of all, Southerners, are you from the South? No, sir. Where are you from? Minneapolis. First of all, people in the South don't like Northerners. <laughs> Secondly, you're talking about belts. They, they don't like Jews either. So you are you are picking the wrong thing to do. Well, you know what? I'll tell you what happened. I I thought to myself, well, I don't. I'm not going to listen to what I had to say. But I can tell you, I called on a lot of belt stores. They have a lot of stores in this area, Virginia, Maryland, whatever. And I made more friends within the bulk organization that I became very, very friendly with some of the staff. Some of the... <laughs> I remember John Belk vividly. I don't know if any of you do or not. Um, John Bell, John Bell, when he was running for uh, mayor, he went to the temple that I belonged to. I've never forgotten that. And he said, somebody asked, do you have any children? Oh wait, no, I mean, do you have any brothers and sisters? And I've never forgotten, you know what John Belk said? My mom had a litter of five. <laughs> <laughs> I have never forgotten that expression. And uh, that litter of five, uh, John Belk's wife was used was a judge. I don't know what kind of judge in Charlotte or in the state or whatever. 
she had her hair done the same place where my wife used to get her hair done. And I would see her frequently. And I tell you, I don't know if she's still alive or not, but a very, very friendly and lovely woman she is or was. I mean, you you get to meet some nice, nice, nice people, like all of you here. <laughs> and I'd like to take you home. <laughs> if we're big enough. Well, thank you, thank you for coming. Can we can we let the scout come up and, and look at some of your memorabilia? Real quick?